Okay, um, 4.22, I guess I'll get started. Thank you for coming. I know it's the last uh, session of the day, but uh, not to be too boastful, but this is going to be the best one. So, um, <laughs> so uh, my name is Andy Watson. I am a developer with a company called Ionic Security in Atlanta. I've been around a while. I started out doing web stuff with uh, Perl CGI back in the 90s and then discovered PHP around 2001-ish and did a lot of stuff with PHP. Um, and uh, built you know logistics applications and e-commerce applications and uh, built a website for a theme park in Orlando you might have heard of. Uh, <laughs> the process is a few million dollars a day in payments. Uh, so I used to write lots of PHP, tons and tons. Um, gradually came to realize there were some limitations as far as uh, things like concurrency that I didn't really like about it. Uh, so now, cut to the quick, I'm going to go for now. Um, I discovered Go a couple of years ago, fell in love with it, and haven't really looked back. Um, so it's got a lot of really great features for enabling uh, concurrency inside applications, and it has a really great community behind it. Uh, it produces a compiled static binary, so it's very small, very fast. Uh, you don't have dependency problems. Things like that. So I re really like the language. Uh, it's really being pushed by a team at Google very hard. The team, the guys that created it are very smart. Uh, they've been around for a while. They invented things you might have heard of, like C and Plan 9, uh, things like that. So anyway, so this talk is about how to create your first web application in Go. I originally had a bunch of slides about why, like specific things about PHP that I don't like. And I decided that was too negative. So I'll just stay positive. Um, uh, there might be still, still be a few. Uh, <laughs> so to get started in Go, you go to golang.org. They have a great tour uh, you can take that runs you through the basics about types and slices and uh, things like then channels and things like that to get to learn more about concurrency. Uh, so that's a really great resource that they've put in like right from the very beginning to help you get on board with using it. Um, this little box over here is a playground, so you can type in the code and change it and run it right there in the browser uh, to do a lot of stuff so you can try things, which is really great. Uh, so the great thing about web apps in Go is that they, because you compile it, it produces this self-contained thing, which uh, then you can just run on a Linux box or a Mac or a Windows box or whatever. You can also cross-compile it, so on your Mac laptop you can produce the Linux binary. You can, or a Windows binary, or an ARM binary that runs on an Android phone, all from the same source. So it's really great. <clears throat> so here's a, here's a very simple Hello World web app. You have this little bit of code with this inline function that just prints out Hello World, and that's all there is to it. Um, you could actually separate that inline function out as a named function that you could call from other places, uh, but to make it fit on the slide, I condense it into one thing. So some of the code formatting in the slides is a little, a little rough because PowerPoint's not awesome, but uh, we'll get there. So in that example, you had some, uh, some raw text that got spit out. But in a real application, you have actually sort of complicated, you know, nested, you, know, you have HTML and CSS and JavaScript. You have actually structures you want to repeat multiple times. You have navigation that you want to render over and over again. And so you want to use templates. So you know, with PHP, you might have Twig, or back in my day, you had you know, Smarty and things like that. Um, so uh, so tw uh, the Go language has a templating uh, part of the standard library. And there's an HTML version of that, which helps you a lot with escaping things that should be escaped when it gets presented on the web, uh, encapsulating things, making things safe to display, and sanitizing things. So here's a simple template that's embedded in a string literal, but could actually also still be in a file separately outside your application to allow you to, mo to, allow you to modify it. So you have this, this HTML tag, and you have these little curly brackets in the middle. Right there. <laughs> and so that's where your interpolation happens, sort of what the, yeah? Could you speak up a little bit? Oh, can you not hear me? Maybe. Sorry. Here, I'll, I didn't have anything to clip it to. Is that better? Okay. <clears throat> so, um, 
So yeah, so we have this template that's in the string, and what happens is the the Go template uh, language looks like these curly brackets, and the dot represents the structure that was passed to the template execution at the top level. If that struct had uh, members of it with names, you could actually refer to them directly in the template like that. And so we'll see that in a second. And then all you do is you still call listen and serve, have the handling function, and you execute the template. The, the must is just a helper that lets you uh, that that function, the must function will basically produce a panic if the template is not parsable or not found. You don't have to use that. Um, and the new creates a new template with a name. In this case, it's QR. So you can create the template ahead of time before you actually execute it, and you can create multiple templates and refer to them inside of each other by name. But in this case, it's a real quick example, so we just parse it and execute it. So what else can you do with templates? Well. Every template needs some simple logic controls. So in this case, we have an if, and then we render the thing if it exists and we don't if it doesn't. So it gives you this great structure. That if could also refer to some other part of the structure, like if it was a book structure that had an agent name or a copyright date, you could say if copyright date you know, um, is greater than this, or if copyright date's not present at all, then do something, and so it gives you this great sort of logical control. Um, so here's some Go code that creates what's called a slice of uh, types. And so a slice is like an array, except for in Go, it's got a little bit more smarts to it, where it can keep track of its own size, and um, some really uh, interesting internal stuff you don't have to really worry about very often, but it's really powerful. So um, even an empty slice uh, actually contains some things, but I won't get into that. So in this case, you have this variable book list, which is an array, of, which is a slice of books, which is a structure, and you you call some mythical function called look up books for sale, and then you execute the template. And what happens is in your template, you have a range operator. And the great thing about this is you don't have to have a bunch of code that says, if this slice is empty, do this. Otherwise, range over, iterate over it, and do this rendering thing. You have this else thing where you can just say range over it and render these h3s or if it's empty do that and so you get this output <clears throat> which uh, saves you a lot of time so what you see in a web app when you first start building it is you have these little handler functions so you say a request to this uri goes to this function and a request to that uri goes to this function and then every one of them has to check well what method was used uh, was this header present? Was this, um, was this person logged in? You know, all these different things. Uh, so what you figure out quickly is the need for a routing library. So there's several routing libraries in this sort of a religious flame war aspect too. People, some people vehemently believe in certain routers and others, you know. Uh, but what this allows you to do, and this one in particular, HTTP router is very fast, is it allows you to set up a request so that a post to this URI goes to this handler, but a get would go somewhere else. And it gives you a lot more control over not just the method, but you can say, uh, you can do stateful things about headers being present. Um, I'm gonna stop holding the microphone. <laughs> I'm just getting tired. Um, there's, lots of, there's a lot more control you have over it that way. And um, the other thing that you can do to sort of avoid a lot of boilerplate code around having the same logging code the same instrumentation code, the same uh, error checking code in every one of those functions is you use a, a middleware. So a really great middleware is one called Negroni, which was built by um, a guy whose GitHub handle is Code Gangsta. And he actually had created a, a framework called uh, Martini, which did a lot of things for you. Uh, it did kind of too much, actually. <laughs> And over time, people uh, disagreed with him about how much it should do, and then even he decided that it did too much, and so you know, he, even he says, don't use Martini. So he rescued certain parts of what it did and created things like Negroni. So Negroni is a middleware package that takes care of a lot of things for you or allows you to write middleware very easily. So if you ask Negroni to handle the requests, instead of just calling HTTP listen and serve directly, then it uh, automatically wraps all your handler functions with middleware. So Negroni Classic 
uh, which you see at the end there, automatically does logging, uh, recovery from panics, which we didn't talk about yet, and static content handling. So it takes care of sort of like the, the basic three things that everybody should use. Uh, another thing you see a lot in uh, the first gen sort of Go web app is a lot of error handling around templates. You know, make sure that the template really exists, uh, make sure that the execution worked because it had all the right things in it, handle the errors if they didn't, you know, and so that boilerplate code sort of takes up a lot of space. And so there's a project called Render, which you can use to eliminate a lot of that re repetitive effort. So Render actually allows you to say, um, you know, <clears throat> R dot, you know, HTML, you give it a structure and you say, render this as HTML, right? Render this template. And it takes care of the MIME headers and things like that for you. So you don't have to constantly call add header this, add header that. Um, <clears throat> another really useful uh, thing is a context. So you have an incoming request that contains certain information. You want to be able to pass that information on to other handlers you call in your middleware chain or even pass on to other requests that you make on the user's behalf. Say you're calling uh, some services in a service oriented architecture. You want to, instead of having to have this ever growing list of parameters you pass to every function call, and every time you add one, you have to go back to all these functions and add more parameters, you create a context object and you pass that around. So you keep passing this context around, and then people can pick out of it what they actually care about as they go along. And it really saves you a lot of time and effort. Uh, the Gorilla Toolkit is a really good one. The Gorilla Toolkit has a lot of these things. It has a, a router, it has a, a multiplexer, it has context, it has session handling. Uh, but I, I prefer not to sort of go all in with one uh, provider and pick the best of each. So, um, so I don't use Mux, which is their version of HTTP router anymore, and I just use HTTP router. Uh, Sessions, everybody knows about sessions with web applications, and so the Go programs are no exception. You have to be able to handle sessions to keep track of information between requests so that you can pretend you have a stateful application um, for all the right reasons. Here's some quick example code that sort of sets up a session. Uh, it allows you to choose which kind of storage you want, whether it's cookie-based or, or otherwise, and it lets you set the normal parameters. And then here's how you would actually interact with one uh, by, by either fetching or creating a new session, saving stuff into it, and then at the end, uh, you have to actually hit, you have to actually tell it to save the data, <laughs> which is uh, something I figured out the hard way when I first started using this particular package because it wasn't saving the information. Um, <clears throat> so you're writing this Go app and you type in the code, you hit save in Sublime Text. You go over to your terminal and you hit go build, and it runs. You point your browser at it, it's great. Then you find a bug. Go back to Sublime Text, make some code changes. Go back to the terminal, hit Control C, because you have to kill it. Recompile it. Go back to your browser over and over again, right? It can start to seem like it takes forever, even though it doesn't really take that long. So uh, Code Gangster came up with a thing called Jin, which you wrap around your process as a proxy and you leave that running. And then what happens is, as soon as you hit save in your editor, it detects that the files were modified, it recompiles your process and restarts it automatically. So you just hit save and you go back to your browser and you hit reload and it saves you a lot of steps. It also gives you some stats and some information about the errors and things like that that are going by, which is really helpful. And then when you're finally you know, done or you know, finished the iteration, you can deploy it to production. The great thing about the cross compilation is if you're going to deploy it to a Linux box, you don't have to have a Linux box. You can just save it on your Mac and then cross compile it with the Go toolchain, which is really phenomenal. The Go toolchain is actually capable of uh, compiling to about 12 different platforms from one, from one place. And then you just copy it to production and wrap it in Upstart script. But alternatively, oh yeah, I forgot I put this little demo in here um, just to show you it actually working. Where'd the cursor go? Oh, there we go. So here I actually have a little simple Go web server. You just type go run, and it runs. It's listening on the port. And then you hit curl, and out comes hello world. So, um, and then I hit control C, and there it goes. So that's, that's like how fast it compiles. And they, they actually, the video capturing process added some lag. So it's actually faster than that. 
Um, but um, it's pretty powerful stuff. So let's do, where the cursor go? Yay, okay. So my actual preferred method of producing something that goes to production now is to actually put it in a Docker container. And so Go programs may lend themselves really well to Docker containers because they don't have any or uh, very few dependencies. They're statically compiled binaries. They're generally very small. And so if you have a very small binary, you can actually start with a scratch image, which has nothing in it, and then add your statically compiled binary to it. And that's the only thing in it, and it runs just fine. Um, <clears throat> there is actually a Golang library image for Docker that contains the entire Go compilation tool chain and runtime tools. And so you can build and run your application with this uh, library image. So your Docker file just has one line in it, which is pretty nice. And then all you do is Docker build and Docker run, and you have it, and it's done. And if it works, then you can push it to the registry for deployment somewhere else. So that's about the easiest way to get something into production that I have ever seen. Uh, alternatively, there is also Go support for Google App Engine. So when I first started looking at Google App Engine, I guess it was a long time ago. It was like 2008 or 9. It was Python only. And a friend of mine had a startup that was built on top of App Engine, and they had some kind of 24-hour outage because it was very new, and it was in beta. So uh, I said, what are you going to do? And he's like, I don't know. <laughs> So I was like, I'm not going to deploy on that right now. But it's really come a long way now in the, in the interval. <laughs> and uh, now they support Go, they support uh, Java, and they support other things. I swear I thought they supported Ruby, but I don't think they do anymore. So with Go, Go seems to be a really big push for them right now for a Google App Engine. Um, what, what you get is you get all this automatic scaling of instances as, as demand increases, you get this highly scalable data store, which you can easily um, use inside of your Google, your Go program, which is highly replicated across multiple data centers for automatically. And you get uh, memcache support built in and all kinds of other things. So here's this quick example of um, using a Go, storing a Go structure in the Google App Engine data store. So you have this structure much like what we would have had for the earlier sort of iterating over things in a template example. And then there's some quick, dirty code that actually just fetches them out of the data store. Um, you have to create an app engine context. You do a query. You can do ordering and limiting and things like that. You make a slice of greetings, which is that, uh, that's that, lot, that middle line there. And so I uh, forgot to mention, with slices, you have to allocate their uh, size, and so is you're calling make. Make is uh, used for maps and slices and channels primarily. And then uh, it goes and fetches them all out. Uh, you see a lot of where it says if underscore comma error. Um, that's a very common thing in Go because Go functions can return multiple things. And so a lot of them, instead of having, there's no uh, exception handling in Go, you just return the original things and an error, or an error. So there's a lot of code that says, OK, comma, error, equal, uh, colon equals this. If error not equal nil, do this. So you see that a lot in Go programs. But it's, it starts to seem normal after a while. Uh, so this actually populates that slice of uh, greeting structures, which you know, a similar function could have retrieved that for the template example used earlier. Uh, and there's a complete example of a guestbook application that Google created for Google App Engine, which goes through all kinds of stuff, which is really helpful for getting started. Uh, there's some other resources that are really good. Uh, Code Gangster himself is working on a book, a Git book about it, which has a lot of information. And then the Google Cloud Platform team has really had a really big push towards increasing the amount of Go documentation and the examples and, and uh, getting started documentation for, for Go. So uh, have I actually deployed anything to go? Yes. Uh, the first, well, I don't know if it was the first thing. Something I deployed recently for a friend of mine who was running the CSS DevConf is a SMS voting application. So what he wanted was people, people to be able to vote or rate their sessions based on S using SMS. So I hooked up Twilio to do a post to this URL from my Go application. And all it does is stick records in the data store. It does some sanity checking to make sure they put a one through five first and then a, 
a string and then a you know then a whatever. If they just put in like blah blah blah, then it would just reject it. You know, it replies and says sorry. Use a one one three five. It's very simple code, and uh, it's been running actually for a year because I did it about a year ago, and I haven't touched it since. And he just checked it and made sure it's still running. <laughs> so that's that to me is lights out infrastructure. Uh, and then I built another thing called other number, which was an idea I had for uh, basically temporary phone numbers you could use. So if you want to sell something on Craigslist or you met somebody somewhere and you weren't quite sure you wanted to give them your actual phone number, <laughs> you could use other number. And uh, it's really great. It has, um, uses pretty much all the, uh, the, the features of the Google App Engine platform. And, and again, it's been running for months and months while I've been paying attention to other things. Uh, and it still works. So it's, it's a really great platform. Uh, for web development. And Google App Engine is very affordable right now, so it's really easy to get started. Um, they're working on the next version of App Engine, actually, so that you can take the App Engine instance they created for you and migrate it into an actual virtual machine you can SSH into and have more control over, which is also pretty powerful. And there's a whole like raft of other features, but I'm not selling Google App Engine right now. <laughs> uh, so that's all the slides. Um, I do have more slides about specifically about concurrency in Go, if anybody wants to see that. Or, or if you have questions, then uh, we, can, we can do that too. Yeah? Is Negroni uh, concurrent by default? Or do you have to like, set some special data? Uh, it's all concurrent by default because of the way that basically it falls down eventually to call uh, the HTTP listen and serve yeah. method. It just wraps a bunch of stuff around those calls first. So it gets down to that point. And so the Go standard library HTTP class takes care of the concurrency aspects of the incoming connections on the socket and all that things for you. So you don't have to worry about that. So nowhere do you want to put like Go, listen, or mm -mm. No. Nope. And actually, in a lot of like, uh, like in the very first example, it just called listen and serve at the end of main. If, if that ever failed because somehow the socket wasn't available, or if it wasn't available at the very beginning, that would fail right away, and the program would just exit. A lot of people actually wrap that in a panic so it'll, it'll, or, a, or a fatal log message. So if it can't open that connection or listen on that socket, it logs it as a fatal error and then dies. Because that's the last thing. You, know, you do all the setup and you get everything put in the right place. And then you call listen and serve because that's the last thing you want to do. And from there on, that's, that's a blocking call. While it hand, and then it handles everything else uh, concurrently inside of that. So anything else? Um, yeah? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Oh, um, you know, it's interesting. I actually used the Gorilla WebSockets um, for a prototype. And then, um, you know, th they're, they're, they made some assumptions about sort of the way people wanted to do sort of wire pa uh, message passing over WebSockets where they didn't work for me. So we actually ended up taking the net RPC package and just wrapping that around uh, the Go standard WebSocket stuff because you could create an I.O. writer automatically. The, the WebSocket stuff defines all the right methods to pass as an I.O. writer interface. I think we added, add, we added one method. And then we were able to just basically create our own RPC over WebSockets and not use the Gorilla stuff. And it, it worked really well for us. but. That's the great thing about a lot of the Go standard library is because of the way interfaces work in Go, uh, a lot of things are interchangeable or can be used, you know, put together, um, and it's not object oriented. So um, that's something else. I, I used to have a bunch of slides about how PHP stinks, and, <laughs> and uh, I took all that out. But I like they all had like this is not good about PHP, and this is great. So I kind of left out some of the great stuff about Go. Um, you know, Go isn't object oriented at all. It was designed to not be object oriented because the guys that created it, Dave Cheney and um, Rob Pike and the team at Google, had been around. They'd been around a while. You know, they wrote C and, and Plan 9 and these things, and so they were around when the theories behind object oriented were first sort of created. And they felt like object oriented programming languages never really lived up to the the promise that was originally given when the theory was created. And so they decided Go is not going to be object oriented. So it has these structures you can define, and you can actually define methods that are tied to structure or types, but it's not object-oriented. There's no inheritance at all. There's only uh, uh, interfaces. 
So all you have to do to satisfy an interface, you don't have to declare which interfaces your structure satisfies. You just have to define the methods that, that meet those, pr those um, prototypes. So if you, have a, if you can define an interface that says anything with a, a function that, with this name that takes an integer and returns a string, uh, meets this interface. And then you can say this function requires that the first argument be something that satisfies this interface. And anybody else can come along later and create their own thing that can do that and pass it as a function as an argument. So it's, it's really great. Um, structure doesn't limit you. You don't get tied up in this thing, you know, extends that and implements this and <laughs> uh, things like that. So it keeps it very clean. Uh, a lot of other great things about Go are the tooling around it. So when you download the Go, the Go tool chain, you get the, the runtime, you get the building tools, you get the cross compilation. You also get other tools. So dependency management, formatting. Uh, when you look at Go source code in any open source project like this, so it's all gonna look very similar because what comes with the Go packaging, uh, the Go tool chain is a thing called Go uh, FMT or FMT. And so all you have to do when you hit save, you set up Sublime Text or whatever it is to run Go FMT after you hit save, and it formats it. So if I went in there you know, and added a couple extra spaces before data store that new query, Go FMT would fix it for me. So you end up with a lot of like, easy to read code. And the reason why Go FMT works so well is because there's libraries in the Go standard library that understand Go and can lex and parse it. So it's really easy to actually write Go programs that understand Go. My friend Peter wrote a program called um, Panic Attack. <laughs> and so what happens is you see down there where it says if underscore comma error equals, uh, that there's a lot of times in Go code where people would do if you know, x comma underscore equals something because they're throwing away the error. <laughs> they don't care. They don't care that an error happened. And so he didn't like that, and so he wrote a Go program that can go through Go source code and find all those and replace them with actual variables, and then if the error, and then and then immediately put a uh, panic. <laughs> so you'll know right away that you left out some error chain handling in your code because when you run it, it panics because he, the go the panic attack thing put uh, a panic in the code for you. <laughs> uh, so stuff like that, and it didn't take it very long to do because the Go packages allow you to do that really easily. So there's a lot of tools for Go because of that, which is really phenomenal. Other languages, you know, kind of struggle with that. Yeah. yeah the, the build system I want to see with it is make. Is that the de facto way to build with Go? Or um, no, actually, I don't use make at all. Um, it, you can use whatever you want. You can use Gradle. You can use make. You can use shell scripts. You can just run it yourself. Um, you know, and, and when I do it, oh, is that going to work? Probably not. Uh, yeah, that was that was botched. Where did it go? Wrong window. Hold on, it's here. So I just do, you know, go build dash o main uh, main dot go, and it just builds it and produces an executable. I mean, you can use make, but you can also kind of use whatever you want. They deliberately didn't want to sort of tie you to any one thing. So so that just works. Um, uh, like antivirus software is going kind of going crazy right now on my computer, so everything takes forever. Normally, that's like 30 milliseconds. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so it's really flexible. Yeah. All right, Kitty wants to know about concurrency. Here we go. <laughs> uh, let's see. All right, so <laughs> I love that cat. I don't know why. Uh, I know I tweeted that there wouldn't be any cat pictures, but I lied. Um, so in Go, what you have is they wanted you to be able to construct things that behaved like your typical sort of threaded applications with protecting uh, coroutines from each other as far as memory space and things like that. What they didn't want is you to have to communicate by sharing memory, right? The mantra is do not communicate by sharing memory, share memory by communicating. And I think at some point you have to get tattooed with that to become a gopher. Um, so if you want to run a function as a concurrent function, all you really have to do is put Go in front of it. Now, this is a simplistic example because that'll just take off and run until it's done, 
and you're not checking to see when it's done or cleaning up after it or anything like that. It's also obviously not doing anything useful because you're not even caring about the return from it. But sometimes you just need that to happen. That, by the way, is like something you can't do in PHP. <laughs> so uh, I had a whole slide about that. I'm not going to go into that. Um, the dark side is calling me, but I'm not going to go. Uh, so they built these things called channels. They're primitive. They're built into the language. They're actual types. You declare a channel as, having, as being able to transport a specific type. Uh, that type can actually be another channel. So you can say, I'm going to send you a channel on this channel. Um, but you have to say what kind of type that channel is. So it comes in really handy for a lot of really advanced concurrency patterns. So this example is a little more robust. This one actually says, uh, the very beginning, we're going to make a channel that can pass integers. And it's an unbuffered channel. So if nobody's listening, then writing into it actually blocks, which is really great. Because then in this go function, if nobody's listening, it'll sit there and block and wait until it can write into it, uh, which is really good for, for um, creating semaphores around things or for throttling things and stuff like that. So. Then you have do something boring for a while or do something for a while. And then at the end, it's going to pull a function out of that channel. It's going to pull a value out of that function. So when at the end, when it gets to that last line, then the one gets fed into the channel because it comes unblocked. And then you get the one out. <clears throat> uh, so they can be buffered or unbuffered. The buffered channels are interesting because you have to declare the size of the buffer ahead of time when you make the channel. And <clears throat> that allows you to create some space for uh, back pressure inside of a you know, service-oriented architecture, things like that. But it can also be pretty tricky because getting the size of the buffers right can be hard. And also things start to act a little strange uh, when you have buffered channels uh, and you don't know if it's getting into the buffer being full or not. Uh, so there's some really great talks that Dave Cheney and Andrew Jaron and those guys have put on about concurrency and Go, which go into a lot more detail. But they also spell out some really interesting examples of um, how to, or different kinds of patterns in Go. Um, one of the really interesting ones is, so say you do a Google search, right? You get results for web, video, images. I don't even know all the things, right? So if you're going to do those all sequentially, it would take a while. If you waited till all those searches had completed and then you returned content to the user, you know, they probably would have switched back to Bing or something by then. So you know, obviously, you want to do all those searches concurrently. And then you take it a step further and say, well, why would you make one request for a web search and one for a video search when you deliber deliberately designed your infrastructure so that if a box fails, you, know, you just pick up and ask somebody else that should be capable, right? So instead, you make five web searches and five video searches all simultaneously. And then as soon as you get one response from each category, you tell the other four to stop and go away, right? So what you do is, you, instead of just calling the search function, you pass it a channel when you call it that says, here's the channel I want to hear from you on when you're done, right? And then you give it a second channel, which is like, here's the message, the channel I'm going to pass you a message on when I want you to stop prematurely. And so what it does is it takes those two channels and it loops over the two of them. And as soon as there's a message on the kill channel, it says, oh, stop, sorry, close my connection to the database or whatever I'm going to do. Uh, or if it gets a result before then, it'll write into the channel that you want to receive your message back on. And then on your end, you're just looping over all the channels you've opened and sent off to these functions, waiting for messages to come in. So you're sort of fanning in all these responses. And it's super powerful. And all that doesn't require any semaphores or uh, weight locks around um, shared memory resources or any of this stuff. So it's, it's super powerful. You can create basically, you know, people say, oh, there's no. Um, there's no singletons because there's no objects. So, like you don't need the singletons. If you want to create a memory structure that can only be modified by one thread at a time, you put it inside of a function that receives all its input from channels, not from function calls. You make it not export it outside of the structure, so nobody can call it except for something else inside of that structure. And then you put a for loop around it that says, wait until a message comes in on this channel, and then modify the structure. <laughs> and then go back to the top and wait for another message. right? That creates your singleton pattern where only one thing can ever write to that structure because only one thing even knows where it is. And the only way to get stuff in is through this channel, which is not buffered, so only one thing could write at a time. And so it gives you that kind of control, which is really phenomenal. 
Um, <clears throat> so I know those aren't very short for short URLs, but <laughs> it's, um, it's hard to do. Yeah. So uh, in Go before 1.5, you could tie a Go program to GDB and try to step through things. But that sort of worked, sort of didn't. Um, the problem was part of the Go runtime was written in C, and part was written in Go. So GDB didn't understand the parts that were written in Go. <laughs> Uh, and so it was kind of a crapshoot. There really wasn't a great way to do it. There are profiling tools and things like that, but not debugging. With Go 1.5, the entire runtime is written in Go. So GDB doesn't work at all anymore. But there's a, GD, there's a Go debugger in development called Delve. Uh, de um, yeah, Delve. So basically, you attach it to your Go program, and now it understands everything inside the Go program. And it's really quite, quite amazing. Um, and that's being developed by the same guys that created the language. I think it's called Delve. Maybe I might be saying it wrong. Um, D E L V E. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, you know, there's there's a whole suite of profiling tools you can use to sort of trace execution. Because of the concurrency, uh, you can actually set environment variables to determine the maximum number of concurrent things that can happen at once. Um, so that used to default to one. And now with Go 1.5, it actually defaults to the number of cores in your CPUs. Uh, it used to be you had to set that explicitly, uh, otherwise it was always one, uh, which made people think like, oh yeah, I don't have any race conditions. I'm like, no, you don't have any race conditions because you're just doing one thing at a time. Yeah? Uh, what would you say is the best embedded database for Go? Best embedded database for Go? Well, I'm partial to Bolt DB, kind of. Um, it's a pretty great database platform. Uh, there's, there's another one called CockroachDB, which is really good that I've been looking at. Yeah, CockroachDB. The, the idea behind Cockroach is it's, it's distributed across nodes, and you know one shoe can't squash it out because <laughs> the other nodes sort of take over. The idea is that it's uh, sort of bulletproof resiliency and enterprise-grade uh, replication and, and availability. Uh, and it's actually pretty great. The guys behind it are very smart. They're former Googlers. They built a lot of great stuff at Google. Um, I think uh, the founder of my company is an investor in their company, so, um, so you should look at CockroachDB. It's really good. BoltDB is very good as well. Um, and then there's, a, there's actually a thing called Chain Store, which allows you to set up a chain so you can say, uh, create a Bolt adapter and a Cockroach adapter and a Redis adapter, and then you just write stuff to the chain and it writes them out down the chain as it goes. Uh, so as a developer, you don't really care where it's getting stored. Like you, somebody else could come along later and sort of add things on to your chain. So, so that's pretty great as well. <clears throat> trying to think of this anything else I missed and go. Um, oh, the Gopher is pretty cute. <laughs> um, so, oh, in uh, Go, you can write mobile apps in Go now for Android. Um, it used to be you could just create little libraries and you had to uh, link the Java app to it. And now, actually, with the Go 1.5 mobile tools, you can create the whole app in Go. So it's kind of crazy to see a Go project with an Android manifest at XML at the top. Um, <laughs> so they have a whole suite of tools that helps you define the bindings if you wanted to do uh, the Java application and a Go library to, so you can match them back and forth with all the Genie stuff, which is pretty great. Um, yeah. All right.